We are a spatial university. I wanted to begin with a map showing where GIS is on campus, but it would just be one large glowing hotspot. We have labs and departments focusing on GI science, remote sensing, geodesign, and spatial computing. And nearly every discipline uses ArcGIS to enhance the three-pronged mission of higher education, teaching, research, and outreach. We're gonna show several examples of how GIS fuels the mission of a spatial university, beginning with our own enterprise GIS department. It starts with the campus map and all the data needed to manage a city within a city. For example, students were hired to walk the campus and record information about sidewalks using Geoform. Similar to any city, keeping our sidewalks in good condition keeps the environment safe and contributes to a safe and attractive environment. We can see the condition of each sidewalk panel, which allows facility staff the, the ability to overlay trouble spots with construction schedules and coordinate maintenance. Now let's talk about our students. Each year, 1,000 are enrolled in ArcGIS courses, and more than 6,300 students, faculty, and staff have named user accounts on ArcGIS Online. They use these online resources to enhance their learning and research with maps, data, and spatial analytic tools. They've created over 20,000 items in the last 12 months. We can look at the university's gallery to get an example of some of these projects. There are maps, maps on farming practices, sustainability, mapping the pre-modern world, and much more. One interesting research example is from the Polar Geospatial Center, which maps the most remote locations on Earth. They rapidly process huge amounts of imagery to create digital elevation models and derive products. Later this summer, in collaboration with the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center, they're releasing a new 8-meter Antarctic DEM that will be available to the public. Our charge at Uspatial, and for hopefully everyone in education, is to develop the GIS workforce of tomorrow to ensure that everyone in the workforce is thinking spatially and to advance the geospatial sciences. Our curriculum reflects all these goals, so let's hear from master student Coleman Shepard to learn more. One thing I'm learning is how to leverage spatial thinking to tackle real-world problems. One of my most recent projects focused on the volcano of Kilauea on the Big Island of Hawaii. It is one of the youngest and most active volcanoes in the Hawaiian island. As so, I wanted to use spatial technologies to further explore the dynamics of the recent lava flows. By accessing Sentinel-2 imagery from the Living Atlas, I was able to understand what was happening across the landscape over time. Starting on May 23rd and moving forward in time, first to June 2nd, June 7th, June 12th, and finally, June 22nd, we're able to clearly see the lava progress throughout the landscape over time. After investigating the available research, I wanted to dive deeper into the science of the seismic activities that is often associated with volcanic eruptions. Over 22,000 earthquakes have occurred since the start of the eruptions. To put this in perspective, only 2,700 earthquakes occurred in all of last year. From this, I wanted to investigate this activity further to see what was happening on the island. By conducting multivariate clustering using k-means, I was able to cluster the earthquakes based on four dimensions, latitude, longitude, depth, and magnitude, and then discovered that this shows three distinct groups, the caldera, shown in red, the rift zone, shown in blue, and the fissures, where the lava is present, shown in green. By switching to 3D, we're able to gain a better perspective on this data. And again, to reiterate, the caldera is shown in red, the fissures are shown in green, and the rift zone shown in blue. But observing these clusters over time, we're able to clearly see that the cluster of earthquakes near the caldera are continuing to increase. This is sparked by magma withdrawing from the caldera, which has led to the instability of the immediate region. Jupyter notebooks and Python are essential tools at our program at the university. And these tools are perfect to explore this phenomenon further. By extracting publicly available data on geodetic stations, I was able to measure the displacement of land over time. I found one station in particular that stood out, NPIT, which sits at the rim of the volcano. This station had dropped over 20 meters in, ev 
and at elevation. This is huge, and it is representative of the eventual collapse of the crater of Kilauea. Central to our training at the university is sharing and collaboration. And this motivated me to create this beautiful map to communicate the dramatic story of the volcano of Kilauea. And next, my classmate is gonna share his research. My name is Kevin Erman Solberg. I'm a PhD student in the Geography, Environment, and Society Department at the University of Minnesota. I am also a co-founder of the Mapping Prejudice Project. Our project is building a spatial database of racial covenants for Minneapolis and the surrounding suburbs. Racial covenants were legal tools used by real estate developers in the 19th and 20th century to prevent people of color from owning or even occupying property. Often just a few lines of text, these restrictions were embedded in warranty deeds throughout the United States. And this is what they sounded like. No persons of any race other than the Aryan race shall use or occupy any building or any lot. This language is incredibly racist. It's also incredibly powerful. It determined where people could live. But mapping racial covenants has proved remarkably challenging. We are building the first comprehensive spatial database of racial covenants by incorporating optical character recognition and crowdsourcing with traditional GIS methods. We use OCR to translate millions of scanned historic property deeds into searchable text documents. <clears throat> we then use Python to parse these text documents, flagging the deeds that contain racial language. These flagged images are uploaded to Zooniverse, an online crowdsourcing platform. Here, volunteers read through these flagged deeds and enter the attribute information necessary for us to build our database. Their answers are exported in JSON and joined with a spatial layer in ArcGIS Pro. This is the result of our work so far. Each blue dot that you see on this map denotes an individual piece of property that was reserved exclusively for the use of white people. And while there's already a lot of blue on this map, if anything, this is grossly underestimating the total amount of restricted land. We expect to add an additional 15 to 30,000 racial covenants to this map by the time our project is done. And while we are still a work in progress, our preliminary results are already shedding new light on how structural racism was embedded into the very built environment of Minneapolis. Racial covenants have been illegal since 1968, but we are still living with their legacies today. Our data shows how racial covenants took racist ideas and translated them into spatial practice. But our data is also suggesting a new way forward. Local city planners are already using our map to redesign the municipal zoning code. <clears throat> and government officials are using our data to reframe long-term planning and development through an equity lens demonstrating how GIS is not only a powerful tool of analysis, but can be an equally powerful tool for social justice. Now, I'd like to introduce... Oh. <laughs> now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Samaya Dodge, one of the faculty members at the U's Geography Department. My research focuses on understanding and prediction of movement through analytics and visualization. Using movement data, we can learn a great deal about the behavior of individuals and from that predict change in national and human systems. With advances in IoT and the ubiquity of smart and connected sensors, we have access to a wealth of high-resolution tracking data that are geo-enrich. What is next? We need to go beyond mapping locations and bring our analytics and maps to motion. Let me show you a couple of examples. We developed a tool to map movement in geographic context. Here you see a movement of one albatross going from Galapagos, where they nest, to the coast of Peru, where they forage for food. If we link this track to the environment, we learn why albatrosses move the way they do. As the 3D graph shows, albatrosses go exactly where ocean food is abundant. Next, I visualize how albatrosses use wind patterns to move. 
For that, I need to map multiple variables, including movement path, speed, direction, wind condition, and time. In this visualization, the red thin lines indicate albatrosses strain into the headwind, and the thick blue lines indicate their faster tailwind flight back to Galapagos. As you can see, albatrosses are challenged by headwind when they fly to the coast of Peru, and after foraging along the coast, they wait for a favorable tailwind to, fly, to help them fly fast back to Galapagos. This journey takes two weeks to do. Our research also helps scientists to study the behavior of tigers and how they interact in their environment. The challenge here is, though, how to highlight interaction while visualizing multiple tracks in space and time. These visualizations show two tigers interacting in their habitat, and uh, as you can see, they visit their shared portion of their boundary often, and a uh, few times they meet at the same location. While they're patrolling their home ranges, they navigate through contour lines and they avoid hilltops. As we saw, movement is a complex, multi-dimensional process which involves space, time, and context. Advanced visualizations will help us to delve deeper into the behavior of these complex phenomena and their relationship to the environment across the spatial and temporal scales. And with that, I would like to turn over to my colleague, Professor Tom Fisher, the director of Minnesota Des Design Center. You have just seen how spatial analytics is transforming the teaching, research, operations, and community engagement as we prepare the future workforce for what's next. I would like you to imagine with me in the next couple of minutes what that next looks like based on geodesign work that colleagues and I are doing. We lived as a species on this planet for over 90% of our time here, we lived nomadically. And only in the last 5% of our history have we lived in permanent settlements with fixed structures and infrastructure that we can map. And amazingly, we are now becoming nomadic again. Mobile devices, spatial tools, digital apps are allowing us to live more lightly on the planet, to access what we need without having to own it, and to pay for only what we use. We see this new nomadism in some of the fastest growing companies in our economy, be they offering us access without having uh, to own goods, such as Airbnb, Uber, and Lyft, or access to online services like TaskRabbit or Lending Club. These companies are thriving not only because they're offering us greater convenience at lower prices, but also because they're leveraging underutilized assets in creative ways. Airbnb has leveraged a lot of spare bedrooms to become the world's largest hotelier without owning any rooms. And Uber and Lyft have leveraged all of the excess seats in cars to become larger than any taxi service without owning any vehicles. These companies embody this new nomadic mindset owning very little and accessing a lot. They are part of a larger sharing economy that is squeezing out the inefficiencies of the 20th century where we overproduced goods and overconsumed resources in unsustainable ways. Look at the car industry. Car companies have realized that they can make more money and greatly lower the cost of transportation for all of us by offering us shared mobility services rather than trying to sell each of us a car. They are also in the process of taking the driver out of our transportation system with shared autonomous vehicles that are cheaper, safer, and cleaner than what we drive now. Our work is looking at the impact of this on the public realm. Shared autonomous vehicles will transform our streets allowing us to narrow roadways, 
widen sidewalks, and provide space for green infrastructure. These vehicles are also going to disrupt municipal budgets. Parking revenues and speeding tickets will largely disappear. But the 30% of the land on average that cities and suburbs now devote to parking is going to become available for higher and better uses, from parks and playgrounds to affordable housing. Spatial thinking is absolutely central to this new economy, helping us access goods and services and helping us identify underutilized assets that can be used to form community sharing services that build local economies and expand the capacity of local governments. Which leads me to a call to action. GIS professionals have an absolutely central leadership role to play in this transition. Every boardroom, every council chamber, every corner office needs the skills of spatial analysts and geodesigners to map the opportunities that exist and to make these unseen connections that will help our communities thrive. This is an amazing time to be alive as we watch humanity go through this transformation. And I hope you are as excited as we are at this increasingly nomadic, spatially grounded future. It's what's next. And with that, I want to with, join with all of my colleagues here from the University of Minnesota to thank you. Thank you.